today we are continuing our discussion with modifying the contract documents. Just a refresher because it's been a couple of months. Last time we talked about uh, the fact that changes are inevitable in construction projects and we need to make sure we establish and follow procedures for making those modifications. The modifications must be within the general scope of the contract. Typically, all parties, the owner, contractor, and architect must agree to the change. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions where the owner can direct a change in certain circumstances and where an architect can make a minor change. And when an owner or an architect initiates the change, it's typically done with a change proposal request. The contract responds or initiates the change with a change order request. So from there, we're going to move into talking about the minor change that the architect can make that does not require agreement from the owner and contractor on a written change order. So a change that doesn't affect the contract summertime, the architect can issue, and the typical form for doing that that I typically use is an AIA document G710 architect supplementary instructions. CSI form 13.4A field order is a similar document and the EJCDC doesn't have a standard form for this but if you look under look at their documents to use those, those uh, types of contract documents, the C700 I believe it would be the appropriate form to use for issuing a um, supplemental instructions. Now, what you need to be aware of that those supplemental instructions, again, should not include scope that would change the contract cost or the contract time. It's usually just a clarification in to some information that's in the documents already and it can include drawings, specifications, or other type sketches. Jim, anything to add? No, I just would um, reiterate the the statement about instructions, that these are really supplemental information or instructions, perhaps uh, the detail wasn't quite there for uh, the construction community to understand exactly how to install or implement uh, what's shown on the documents and that it, it really isn't um, a substantive change but more an instructional uh, application of how to do the work, um, not, not means the methods but what was intended uh, within the documents. And uh, both Doug and Jim, we had a little bit of info here from Kevin on the call, just letting us know that the EJCDC field order is actually known as document C942 uh, and is used for authorizing minor changes. I wanted to point out CSI standard form for the, the architect engineer to authorize minor changes is also called the field order. Thank you for that. All right. Yeah. Thank you. The next document to use is a change directive. Uh, again, the AIA document is, as I'm typically using the AIA uh, contract documents for most of our projects, the AIA document is the one that I use and the one I'm, I'm most familiar with. The change directive uh, directs the contractor to make a change to the, to the project before a price or time implications are agreed upon. I know in North Carolina on state projects they use a field order which is not the same as the field order we talked about before but the state of North Carolina has a document that they call a field order where that is done. Um, basically it's a written order prepared by the architect, signed by the architect and the owner uh, that directs the contractor to make uh, the change. Now, Attached to that may be additional documentation, be it sketches or specifications or modified drawings that uh, further define what that change in the scope of work would be. We, I typically try to avoid using them. Uh, I don't think contractors generally like them. 
I will use them if time is of the essence and we need to get the change implemented so that it's not a delay into the project and we don't have time to go through the usual change order process of getting a proposal out, getting the price back, looking at the price, is it okay, Mr. Owner, are you okay with it, yeah, because that takes time. So if it's something that we know needs to be done, it's on the critical path, it's going to impact the schedule, I will issue uh, a CCD, which is the AIA document, Construction Change Directive, in those instances. The contract is obligated to perform the work upon receipt of the CCD. And then, again, that is provided within the uh, scope of the uh, original contract. You can't have a project where your contract is for painting an office and then issue a CCD that says, no, now you need to add a three-story addition that's 10,000 square feet to the building. That would not be... That's not what a uh, uh, CCD contemplates and would be outside of the scope and gets into cardinal change which we talked about last time. So once that's issued, the contractor starts to work, he still needs to prepare a proposal request. He responds with this proposal request, you agree to the time and the cost, and that is incorporated into a change order that all three parties sign. Jim? Well, I was just going to touch on a couple of things that you highlighted, and, and it seems that my experience has been that change directives get used uh, more often than not when the team can't come to an agreement uh, on, a, on a proposed price, and I don't really believe that that's the intention of the document. Um, I think that it's more, as Doug said, a document can be used uh, to move things in a in a timely fashion. Everyone realizes there's a change. Everyone realizes it's going to be some sort of an additional cost. Everyone realizes that the schedule is paramount to be adhered to, and this it protects uh, the parties in such a way that that work can go ahead and proceed. It may be that there's something that's discovered that has a long lead time to be ordered, um, a piece of equipment provided from someone else, from another prime subcontractor. So I think uh, the in the team spirit of what you know our profession is about, this is an opportunity to work together to an end and not use it uh, to force work uh, as often it seems to be used for. Um, and I would, uh, I would just add to that that in the event that these documents are used, reaching that agreed upon price as soon as possible is certainly a preferred project management practice. Uh, working diligently through what that eventual impact will be uh, concerning the schedule also needs to be a piece of that. Yeah, Jim, I agree wholeheartedly. Like I said, I'd avoid them as much as possible. According to the AIA general conditions, and if the owner and the contractor do not agree on the contract sum or the time adjustment, then per AIA documents, the architect is to determine the method for payment and time. And if the contract doesn't agree with the architect's determination, then it goes through dispute resolution. So what Jim's point is, what we try to do is let's come to an agreement and avoid the dispute resolution process. There you go. Do we have yeah. any comments or questions on this topic? We have quite a few, actually. It looks like you, uh, you hit on some good info here. Uh, so just wanted to come up at the beginning here. Um, um, Kim Tiet, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, has a couple of comments here to see. Um, with all my projects, the, the AE issues um, and SI, um, but actually it must be a proposal, a proposal request because it costs extra time and money. 
Um, the AE depend on the contractor to tell them, um, is it an extra now? Um, AE can tell whether it is an extra or not, um, but why AE issues the SI is kind of the question there. Um, and then later on, just to clarify, I think there's some additional info on that, um, indicated that they had had work experiences with the change directive um, on three projects having CD, um, and they ended up having to take the owner to court, uh, the owner to court to get money, um, which is the reason why they tend to lean towards consensus stocks in this um, instance. I don't know if you have some info on that, and then we have a few more questions after that as well. Let me wow. comment on, on the. I'm sorry, Jim. Let me comment on the first, the first uh, point about why would an then a e architect or an engineer issue in ASI or architect supplemental instructions. Again, it shouldn't. It should be in a case when the information provided is not impacting cost or time. So it's, as Jim said, it's supplemental instructions. An example of when that would be used and valid would be, say, you've got a new building, documents are issued, uh, you have your finished schedule, and your finished schedule says that the north wall is an accent paint color, but you fail to say what color that is. And so what you're providing the, the contractor at that point is supplemental information, I want it blue. Painting it blue, painting it white, painting it red, provided it's not some kind of special paint, is the color doesn't affect the cost of time. So you issue, whether you discover it or it's asked in an, in an RFI, and it could be that, that you discover it, and, or it could be, like I said, in response to an RFI, you're giving him additional information that's not affecting the cost and it's not affecting the time. We want the accent color should be blue. Jim? I was going to say, you're right, I, I agree, and, and those are the circumstances where it would apply, and I think uh, it's a great question because one of the case studies that we're going to talk about uh, it sounds like it may have come, you know, from from this person's comment. Um, well, we're going to get to that about what happens with a change directive when you sign it and send it, and the owner hadn't agreed. Okay. All righty. Um, so then we have a couple more things here. Um, Kevin continues to offer us some good help here. So he says. A uh, way to think about it is that a change directive essentially serves as a promissory note to the contractor. Um, and then indicates down here below when the contractor countersigns the AIA G714, um, it can be used for modifying the contract price per the A201, whereas EJCDC C940 cannot be used for changing the contractor price or contract time. Um, so I don't know if you have any comments on that you'd like to, to address. Um, or so we have one more as well. I, I appreciate Kevin's input. I know Kevin has c corresponded with Jim and I following these pr uh, presentations in the past, and he uses the EJ CDC documents uh, in his work. Uh, as I said before, I typically use the AIA documents. So I'm glad that he's participating and can share uh, his experience from using a different set of documents than the ones that, that I'm used to using. Okay, great. And then the last one is a question from Joe. Uh, Joe Richmond asks, um, is this usually something that happens when there is a discovered condition, and how fast is the architect expected to act? A change directive, a CCD, could be used if it's a discovered condition. Uh, I think it could also be used if it was just a change that the owner wants to make and the owner knows they want to make it. and and it's not like a hidden condition. Uh, I think it could be used in either of those cases. Um, if it is a, say, a concealed condition and you're doing uh, a renovation project and the contractor opens up the wall and finds that there's asbestos in there that nobody knew was there, uh, obviously he didn't have that in his scope. It could be added to his scope through a CCD. 
uh, and asbestos might be a, a bad example <laughs> to use, but if there was something that, that is uncovered during the demolition that no one knew about, making that correction or taking care of addressing that issue would be certainly you could do with the CCD. Um, yeah, contractor, we need for you to relocate all that plumbing piping in the wall, and and you know we know it's got to be done. Here's your CCD. Go ahead, do it. Work on your trans proposal, but in the meantime, start taking it out. It could be used in that case. It could be that the owner's got to change the scope. I want to make the office 110 square feet instead of 10 square feet, so we're going to move the wall out. And it could be used in that manner. So the owner knows he wants to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to pay for it. Contractor, just go. Uh, I think it could be used in either, either one of those situations. As how soon should the architect react? As soon as possible. Um, you d certainly do not want to be the cause for a delay uh, and, and be at risk for any delay claims or charges. Uh, in the it's best example, if nobody knew it was there, I think your duties would be to, and it could be that the contractor sees something and he thinks it may be asbestos and doesn't know. So he informs the architect. Your duty as the architect is to probably get out there, put your eyes on it, and use your experience. And if you don't know, then immediately you tell the owner, owner, we got an issue here. You need to address it and hire some experts to come in here and deal with it. So you certainly don't want to sit on anything. Right. Great. Well, that is all the questions we have now, so we can continue to move forward. Change orders. The method for modifying a doc documents with a change order. The change order is a written instruction that's issued to the contractor that all three parties are signing off and agreeing on. It has in there the scope of work. It has in there the contract time that may be changing, if it's changing, it is in there the adjustment to the contract amount. Uh, typically, they are prepared by the architect, but they can also be prepared by the contract. I've done some projects primarily when there is a CM involved where the CM actually does the, the paperwork in terms of filling out the form and, and circulating it for signature. I also had a job once where the owner actually did it, the owner's rep uh, on the owner's side, the owner's project manager prepared it. But typically it's done by the design professional. Um, the owner needs to sign that to authorize it. Um, architects, engineers cannot spend the owner's money. Only the owner can spend the owner's money. So we can do ASIs or supplemental instructions that don't spend money or affect time, but the owner has to agree if it's going to cost him more money or if it's going to cost the project more time. So those need to be executed by a contractor as well as the owner. Uh, AIA document is G701, the uh, EJCDC document is C941. And Kevin, if you're still out there, if you want to add any more information about that that document, feel free. Um, the change or is used to incorporate into the work any changes that may have been made through other documents. So if there was an ASI and the contractor says, no, this is additional cost, and he sends a proposal request, and the architect looks at it and says, yeah, you're right, it is additional cost. That needs to be, the ASI doesn't satisfy the requirement to change the document, to modify the contract documents. That needs to be put into a change order. If you get an RFI and your response to the RFI results in something that is changing the actual scope of the work, that needs to be incorporated into a change order. Um, the field orders or CCDs that are directives, those need to be incorporated into change orders as well. You can't just issue the CCD that has a, a way or method of determining what the price would be but doesn't have the price in it. You got to put that price into a change order and get everybody to agree to it. So uh, all changes need to be properly 
properly documented, including uh, substitution requests. Next uh, session, we're going to talk about substitution, so I'm, I'm not going to hit on substitutions uh, too much. This this month, we'll talk about substitutions next month. But even if it's a substitution request, that is a change to the requirements of the documents. If you specified manufacturer A, B, and C, and that's what's in the contract, and then during construction, the, the contractor comes back and says, well, I can get manufacturer X for cheaper, and it's an equivalent product, and everyone agrees, the substitution request that he submits doesn't change the requirements of the documents. The only thing that will change the requirements of the documents are the items we discussed before, the ASI, a construction change directive, or a change order. So you can approve the substitution request, but then that needs to be incorporated into a change order document. Change orders, I think Jim mentioned this before, they need to be processed timely. You should agree as a team on the price in a timely manner. Any I guess a lot of times I see on both sides games being played, which I don't like to do, where um, you don't agree on the price, and so you try to stall and, and gain an advantage somewhere. You don't need to be playing those games. You need to come to the table, sit down, negotiate, agree on it, get it in the document, get the project going. That's right. I, the, the most successful projects I've been a part of uh, have uh, at least uh, in, in the team meetings, the progress meetings, construction meetings, owners meetings, whatever you want to call them, uh, part of that meeting was to review and agree on changes that had happened in the last week, uh, depending on the schedule and, and what was being accomplished with the project in the last week, in the last month the last two weeks and uh, doing that together uh, in a meeting form face-to-face, -face, uh, agreeing to do that ahead of time, working through what those changes are and then processing those on a monthly basis uh, I think makes for a real team spirit and it's very important to maintaining the momentum of a job. And I'll tell you, I was very fortunate to have a mentor teach me uh, at a young age about construction administration and his story was that at the end of the construction someone ought to be able to walk up and check out of the library this document about the project that you just finished and they should be able to read that document and understand everything that went on from start to finish and if you've prepared it that accurately and to that level of detail then you've done your job um, he also taught me that I better not approve any changes unless, uh, without the owner agreeing to a number unless I was going to write the check for that change myself. So as Doug said, getting that authorization before you spend money is critical, but then documenting the story uh, is just as critical. And, and I believe in doing that in a timely fashion uh, will make for a much better novel uh, in the end than, uh, as Doug said, you hear this all the time, well, that's only a $300 change, let's pile them up and wait till we got some more and we'll do one then. Or this is a time request, we don't know what the life of this job is going to be like, let's wait till we get to the end to do the time. Um, you've heard, I know all of you have these kinds of statements, and I, I, I find them to be the very things that pit us against one another in this business than uh, in enhancing and supporting the team. One uh, word of caution as well. Um, probably all of the contracts out there require changes to be done in writing. Now, just because a contract says that doesn't necessarily, in a court of law, mean that if you don't have it in writing, that it's not a change and the contractor is not entitled to payment for it. Now, it may be a good defense, but it's not absolute. There can be agreements that are 
made verbally that would be valid. It could be through course of dealings, uh, actions, implied consent, knowledge, uh, unjust enrichment are all different ways that a contractor may be able to pursue getting compensated for a change even though there was not a written change order. So, uh, and I'm not sure what the mix is that we have on the call, whether we have everyone, owner, architect, designers, contractors on the call, or if it's just architects. But we need to be careful in, in how we deal with changes. Because if a change comes up and it's one of these minor $200 changes, like Jim was saying, and we say, oh, well, we'll wait and do a change order later. And then a big one comes up and we talk about it and the contractor gets instructions on how to do it but we're disagreeing on the price and the contractor goes ahead and does it and you see that it's been done and the owner's been out there and he sees that it's been done and then you want to come back and say well we didn't give you a change order for that we're not paying you for it that may not necessarily hold up any comments or questions or raised hands from the attendees um, you had pointed out to Kevin, he said actually the uh, AIA and the EJCDC document are very similar, so nothing to add there, but did put out there another little um, word of wisdom here. Just remember that when a product is equivalent as determined by the AE, it's an or equal. Um, when it's not, it's a substitution. So just remember that's kind of the, the difference sometimes uh, when it comes to calling out changes of items. Yeah, I think that could depend on how you're have those terms defined in your documents in your front end. The way I, and again, substitution is the next topic. The way I do it in, in our documents is that if it's not a specified product or manufacturer, then it's a substitution by definition. So moving on to the next topic, protective measures and risk management. We talked about this before. We need to establish and make sure we follow modification procedures that are in the documents. Once those are established, make sure you follow them. Again, if you vary from that, then you are subject to being found to have, through your course of dealings, created a change when you may not have wanted to create a change. One of the best things you can do to protect yourself and manage risk with change orders is make sure that you prepare a quality and coordinated set of documents. Uh, you should stress to the owner that they need to allow adequate time to prepare the documents. I have seen on multiple occasions the AE is given a condensed schedule. With a condensed schedule, you don't have the time to prepare the documents as you may want to, you may not have the time to go back and give it that extra look over, and so obviously the chances of something being not coordinated or missed is increased. So uh, one of your best best uh, risk management provisions would be to explain to your owner, educate your owners that it takes what we do takes time, and if you want to well a, a, a quality set of documents that are well coordinated, we need to have the time to do that. Now, you may not always be success, successful in, in being able to negotiate your uh, your schedule, the time you have to prepare the documents, but then you need to educate the, the owner that that is going to expose him, or could expose him to the risk of additional change orders during construction because you didn't have the time to prepare the documents adequately. Uh, advocate for realistic project budgets and adequate contingency. Um, contingency is set aside for these types of items. Uh, a lot of owners, especially the ones that are new to construction and are sophisticated, will think, well, okay, I've got a contingency over here. That's mine to spend for upgrades. No, the contingency is there for unforeseen conditions, 
design error on emissions, things like that. So again, it's an education process that we need to do a better job educating our clients uh, and and real realistic project budgets. We need to make sure that the expectations are in line with what the budget is. I think that's the, I think that's an important one, Doug. Um, we talk about our work in these kind of ways. We do project management, or we do program management, um, we do construction phase management, and all of those we have a component of expectation management. And that is our client, our owner's understanding. And in ignorance, I don't use that word in a negative sense. Uh, I'm working at a hospital. I don't understand health care. I understand how to design for health care. And so helping that owner understand and uh, be educated so that they don't feel foolish and that they do feel like they understand what's going on is as much a part of what we should be doing as anything else. Pre-qualifying contractors, I think, is another uh, big step that we can take to help reduce risk. Make sure that the contractors that are going to be working on the project are qualified to perform the work that we're talking about. You would not hire a contractor that specializes in multifamily housing to do a hospital. Um, if you don't pre-qualify your contractors and you just let anybody out there with a GC license get on the job, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, I would include, as it says here, pre-qualifying the major subcontractors, uh, plumbing contractor, the electrical contractor, the mechanical contractor, and in some cases you may even want to go down to like fire protection, sprinkler contractors, or uh, depending on the type of work, you may even want a, a pre-qualified concrete contractor or a masonry contractor depending on, on the design of the building. So making sure that you got quality contractors goes a long way in uh, making sure that you're going to get a quality job and avoid changes that someone that didn't know what they were, were doing would be presenting you with. Um, I'm going to pause and we're going to have her through the slide and see if there's any comments or questions on those items before we move on to the next four. Any, just any? One thing. Just for one, Susan, uh, you had your hand raised. I sent you a message if you had a question or not. Um, so just let me know um, and I could be happy to ask that question for you or unmute your line for you to ask the question directly as well as other Joe. Um, I see your hand is raised as well. If you have a question, please feel free to send that in as well. So we'll go on to the other items on here. Making sure that you have an effective contractor work plan in coordination. There are contractors responsible for coordinating and sequencing the scope of the work. We, as design professionals, define the quality, the design intent. The contractor deals with the construction, the means and methods of how to get it built. And this, again, goes back to pre-qualifying contractors. If the contractor does not have a good work plan, doesn't look ahead, isn't coordinating the trades, has got stuff out of sequence, you're going to run into issues where you get into that adversarial position and change orders are going to be coming. He's going to need to, you know, well, he put something in pre uh, subsequent items, so he's got to take it out and, and redo it. So he's lost money. So now he's going to be looking on, well, where can I make that up? So you want to make sure, again, you get quality contractors that they're planning the work, that they're looking ahead. And, uh, that will go a long way in reducing the risk for, for change orders. Effective, open, and honest communication. 
is another big one, and I know uh, Jim is a strong advocate for that, as I am. So I'm going to uh, let Jim comment on that item. Well, I just think that, uh, you know, we, we all want for that in our daily practice, and we want to know, uh, I'll use payment as an example, uh, times are tough, and if a client is going to pay you, that's great. And if they're going to pay you a little late, that's great, too, if they're going to pay you. But knowing it ahead of time certainly makes you able to operate your business and function uh, appropriately. And I think this is something that is happening to many of us, especially over the last two years. I don't think it's any different in the construction community. Uh, if they know what we're doing, then the whole team is informed and, and feels much better about working together. Whether it's a return of a submittal or a return of a change order, a processing of the pay application, uh, I, I, I believe that what we do uh, is affected greatly by momentum. And when money flows, the momentum is at its best, and the schedule items can be undertaken as they need to be. And I think all that flows back to just being open and honest. It is what, if you think back to circumstances of when you have caught someone being dishonest, what kind of category do you put them in? And how much effort do you put forth to work with them and to nurture that kind of relationship? So, I think if we think that way uh, and we keep that as a focus during the project, we ignore uh, the issues and hold ourselves to a personal expectation of being open and honest. We're, we're working in as successful an atmosphere as we possibly can. Yeah, and as it relates to modifying the contract documents, I would much rather have a contractor come to me and say, I missed this in my bid. I know it's in the scope of work. Is there a way I can get compensated for it? And I've had that happen before, and I've gone to the owner. And in some cases, we may have asked for some documentation to support that position. In other cases, I've seen the owner not even ask for that and say, oh, yeah, OK, we're going to pay you for it. That, to me, goes a whole lot longer than trying to hide money and other change orders to cover something that you missed. And I think that goes both ways for the design professionals as well. If you miss something in the documents and it's a valid change request, the contractor asks for it, even if it exposes you to some liability, you need to own up to own up to it. Be open, honest. It's, people are going to remember you from job to job. And you need to keep that integrity and that honest reputation which I think is invaluable. Uh, change meeting reviews, that can be a part of your uh, monthly or weekly owner, contractor, architect meetings. It's a time to sit down and review the cost, review the time, look at the status of change orders, give the owner an update so he can go back and verify what his contingency amounts are. So that as he goes forward, he's making informed decisions. I think those kind of meetings or having those types of discussions as part of an OIC meeting is just great for the project. Last thing on here is the change log. We should be maintaining a change order log. That log should contain the date that it's run, obviously. It should include the change proposals, numbers, orientation, whether uh, the change originated from an RFI or proposal request or, or what the orientation was. The description of the change, the purpose and reason for the change, cost estimate, time impact, and the current status of the modification. So if it is in a change order, it should stay somewhere on, on your, you should have a column there. That this is in change order one. If it's pending, architect review, you have that as a status or it's our text approved it is on to the owner for owner's review. That way everybody can look at that log on a regular basis during these change review meetings and see the status of everything. If there's any issues that need to be discussed, you can do it and everything's there. Everything's there and you can handle it and, and as we keep the project moving. The biggest 
thing is to just make sure that we're keeping the project moving and not uh, causing delays, keeping the payments flowing, not causing financial issues for the contractors. If he's got a bunch of change changes out there that have not been put in the change orders, it's cash flow. It's going to hurt him financially. Anything from uh, you, yeah. Jim? Yeah, yeah, I think he covered it. Alrighty, well, this is Matt. We have uh, some feedback. Both Joe and um, Susan have responded back with their hands raised as well. Then I have another question from Michael and a comment from Kevin here. Uh, so Joe's question was, um, as far as pre-qualifying contractors, I put HOs, H-O lowercase s, is it um, is that related to the lowest, most reasonable bidder and front-end specification? And it kind of clarifies there with the problem he runs into on smaller commercial projects is that you end up uh, with the contractors move from residential to commercial um, as potentially convince the owner to use them despite any cautions moving forward um, to use them anyway. Uh, so I guess do you have any comments or feedback on that for Joe? And then we can go from there. Well, when we pre-qualify contractors, we have them fill out a document and provide us with a bunch of information. And we will do that pre-bidding so that the contractors and all the subcontractors know who has been pre-qualified versus who has not been pre-qualified. And a contractor going to an owner and convincing them that they can do the job, if they haven't gone through the pre-qualification process and the owner says, put them on the list, I don't know other than trying to convince the owner if you know that he's not qualified and going to the owner and explaining to him why he's not qualified, if the owner still says, no, I want him on the list, I don't know if there's much that you can do about that. Um, I think if you are pre-qualifying contractors, you need to make that pre-qualification process clear and define what it is that you are looking for and what the qualifications are going to be needed to do the job, uh, whether it's license classification or experience doing this type of project or experience doing this square footage of project or experience doing this dollar amount project. All of those come into play. And what I find is even bigger that we ask for is, tell me who's going to be on the job. I want to know who the superintendent is. I want to know who the project manager is. This, you can have a, a qualified contractor, a qualified general contractor that has it staffed with unqualified individuals, and that doesn't do you any good. This uh, the gentleman that I spoke of earlier that taught me this business used to say he wished that we could publicly take bids on the superintendents and just take whatever company that came with them because those are the people that make the job or break the job. And I think that's what Doug just said to a large degree is true. Uh, one of the things that I would throw in, I have seen on some projects, I know everybody's busy and we don't have time to do things, but I have seen architects and owners go to look at some of the projects uh, which these supposedly qualified contractors used as references and uh, be amazed at what spending a day in a car together will do for you and your client uh, and also amazed at what you may see when you go do that and do those field visits. Uh, and so it doesn't, you know, it's not inappropriate. I think to go and take a look. Right, uh, Joe did just follow up. Um, you, Douglas, um, you referenced a pre-qualifying questionnaire. Is there a standardized one you use or a reference where you normally go to look for that questionnaire or is that something that you personally produce? I had produced one in the past in North Carolina on um, state projects where we are allowed to pre-qualify contractors, the state has their form uh, that we would use their form. Um, I have also seen other institutions like major universities that will pre-qualify, not necessarily here in North Carolina because they'll defer to the state's form, but in other, other states where if it's a, a major university or some uh, institution that 
does a lot of construction that they may have their own form that they use. Okay. Um, and then I think that covered everything for Joe. Um, we're going to go over to Susan's question here. Susan put that typically the proposal has a very um, general description of the work uh, to be included or modified. Um, by writing the description herself, she can enunciate the necessary detail in the description to assure the work is done correctly. Um, but she's seen co uh, colleagues write the change order by simply referring to a change order proposal that is then generated by the contractor. Is it a, rec is it a recommended approach? Um, she's just wondering whether or not her approach is okay versus, you know, what's, you know, industry standard they got. I'm not sure that there's an industry standard. Um, and I think it depends on what you get from the contractor and your relationship and the trust that you've built up with that contractor. If I'm working with a contractor that I know and they send me a proposal request and it's clear enough in the request as to what the change is, I don't know that I would necessarily refer to that proposal request, but I may use the same language that he put in there and put that on my change order. Um, I if I'm, I'm sorry, to that. just the flip side of that, if it's a contractor that I don't trust and haven't worked with and his description is vague, then I'm going to be specific in what that scope is when I put the change order together. I think whether it's the initial documents or if it's the change to the documents, the scope definitely needs to be clearly defined. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think in the in the practice guide as attachments there are some forms. Uh, one of the things that I think is advantageous about not just using the information sent to you but requiring it to be put in a certain format is uh, there is more opportunity for it to be correct. Uh, and by that I mean using a, a typical contractor's form, uh, let's say they have private small work, they may have their spreadsheet set up to add 40% overhead and profit when really they're only allowed 10% on your project. So it makes it a little more onerous for you to go back through and verify that it, that it is actually uh, you know, in, in concert with your specifications for the project. That's a good, a good point, Jim. Okay. Uh, we have a couple more questions popping in here. One from Michael. Um, asks um, a slightly different question here. Um, how can the credit of a contractor be checked before awarding the contract? Um, how can the owner determine if there's been past claims against the contractor? You know, of any way that it's happened. Dun and Brass Streets is one way, and we have asked for done reports before. Uh, you can just do an internet search. And, and check. Uh, one thing you ask for in your pre-qualifications, I would ask them, have you been involved in any claims in the last 10 years or whatever? And if they say no and come to find out that they have and they've been awarded the contract, then they were, were awarded a contract through giving false information so they may be subject to other liabilities. Um, but there are means to check, again, a quick internet search, Dun & Bass, Bradstreet reports, calling on references, checking with other folks you know in the industry. Um, and checking with the licensing board where they're working. Um, yes. I assume most uh, have, have those sorts of records, whether they're in good standing. Um, I would uh, perhaps check with a Better Business Bureau in certain areas because uh, and also in North Carolina, uh, where we have um, uh, government agencies in support of uh, historically underutilized businesses, you may check with them uh, because they, uh, their subcontractor community may have uh, a vast body of information to share about how the contractor operates uh, from their regard. Next question. 
All righty. Uh, the next one is from Kevin, um, and he just requested, due to the complexity of the statement, I'm actually just going to unmute you quick here, Kevin. Um, so you should be able to talk at this point. Uh, hello. Hi there. Hey, Kevin. Uh, uh, good presentation uh, today, and uh, just wanted to, I guess, talk in a couple things here. Uh, one, uh, regarding contractor qualifications, uh, Consensus Docs has a couple of forms, uh, one of which is, I think, Consensus Docs 220 and the other one's 221. They're similar. One is for a general qualification of a contractor uh, for, you know, a, perhaps a variety of jobs. The other one's qualifications of a contractor for a specific project. Uh, within about six months or so, uh, EJCDC will also have a, a qualifications form standard document available. So. Uh, sometimes using one of those standardized forms, uh, it, they, they often include some extra things that maybe uh, I don't think of if I'm trying to come up with my own. So just one thought there. Uh, another on qualifications or pre-qualification, uh, always a good idea, I think, on private work, which is probably the majority of construction, on, on public work, uh, there are so there is legislation in different jurisdictions that's starting to enable it to a certain extent, but always uh, kind of a more iffy thing in trying to pre-qualify uh, contractors on on jobs with that involve public money, so just you know, food for thought there. Uh, on this slide here that uh, mentions uh, risk management, there was a, a lot of ways as you know, basically aimed at have chopped down on the number of, of change orders. Uh, one concept that EJCDC had that is not addressed by AIA, although I don't know why uh, someone using an AIA set of documents couldn't include it in uh, perhaps their Division One specifications. Is, is a concept called the contingency allowance. Uh, AIA covers cash allowances and quantity allowances, but EJCDC also has a contingency allowance, which is, in fact, a, a prepaid change order uh, account uh, that is part of the contractor's contract price, or if you will, contract sum. And uh, now the, the trick is, if using a contingency allowance, you have too much or too little, and it is also uh, obviously needs to be okayed by the owner uh, prior to advertising the project for bids or negotiating with uh, prospective contractors on pricing. You, you need to work that out, you know, before it's the AE is done preparing construction documents in the first place. And I think a key thing is how are how is authorization of funds under the contingency allowance going to be handled? Uh, it should, I, I believe, be in writing. AIA has a contingency allowance form that my firm uses for this kind of thing. And uh, what I do on my own projects is, uh, you know, where, where an owner has okayed the use of a contingency allowance, uh, the owner's board, which may meet only every two weeks or every, uh, maybe perhaps once a month, the owner needs to authorize somebody in their own organization who's there day by day. Uh, to be able to uh, okay uses of the contingency allowances. As I think Doug said earlier in the presentation, uh, it's never the AE's place to spend the owner's money, only the owner should be able to do that. So for the contingency allowance, uh, assuming it's all handled properly, assuming that the owner has okayed it in advance, uh, it's a useful tool for taking care of uh, what are often smaller changes that affect the contract price uh, without having to resort to a change order later. and then it, the end of the project, uh, if there's unused contingency funds uh, still available, uh, that's reduced uh, to zero, uh, reduced to the amount actually required or authorized by a final change order at the end of the job. So contingency allowance, kind of a neat concept where the owner is okay with it. Thanks, Kevin. I, I've used that before, not often, but I have used that before. Alrighty, and we have one final question here before we can go back to the presentation, because um, we are also getting a little low on time for today. Uh, from General Parker asks, when the owner insists on using a contractor that isn't pre-qualified, do we have them sign a waiver to ensure we aren't held liable for the job not being completed on time or that meets the quality required by the contract documents? If you could get them to sign something, I'd wouldn't discourage it. I think you'd be hard pressed to get him to agree to it. Uh, I know if I was the owner, I would not agree to it because uh, at that time you don't know you I mean, if you're just issuing the contract to the contractor, you have no idea as the owner whether or not there is a design issue 
So why would I say, okay, I'm using this contractor, but I'm going to let the designer off the hook for everything, but come find out there is a design issue that causes a delay? I guess I would add it, it you certainly, though, could um, memorialize your concerns and correspond to the owner in some documented fashion that this contractor, this particular contractor, did not meet the qualifications of the others uh, upon whom they're being measured or compared, and that you have valid concerns about that so that that is documented so that you can prove that they received that information before things headed south. Yeah, I would certainly do that. And if that was the last question, it is 1 o'clock by my clock. I don't know, Jim and Matthew, if we want to hit these case studies, if we're going to keep going or or not. I was just saying to Matthew through the chat box here, and perhaps we save the case studies and make that a follow-up to this session and perhaps uh, expand them some uh, and come back to that when we've got a full hour because I. Now, it's just me, but my hope is that this can generate a lot of questions and conversation. Matthew, what do you think? I'm fine with that. I'm fine with really whatever uh, works best for you. At the moment, we still have a, a fairly good crowd of people here, um, but I do also know that you know, people probably do have other things on their work plate as well, and I'd hate to uh, necessarily shortchange those, uh, those case studies and poll questions as we get on the next steps. Jim, why don't we do that then? We'll uh, pick up next time with case studies. We had four that were prepared, and maybe we can put together a few more and uh, right. review those. If you review those next month, I think great idea. Okay, now I'm gonna skip past those and just jump to this conclusion. We've all probably seen this picture before, but I'm not sure that it kind of implies that the contractors like change orders because that's where the big bucks are. Most contractors that I've talked to don't like change orders because they feel like they're not getting compensated and it has a big impact on them, sequence, scheduling, and it can be very disruptive, disruptive to their, their process. So. Uh, it's an interesting uh, boat and smaller boat there, but if we want to be careful with changes, know that they happen, prepare for them, have open and honest communication, and, and do the best we can to kind of mitigate and, and minimize them. So again, we thank you. Thank you for participating. We did have a, a lot of good questions and just good discussions. That's what we are looking for. And if you have any uh, questions we didn't get to and you want to email them to either me or Jim or Matthew, I have my email and Jim's email there. I don't have Matthew's there. Maybe we should, Matthew, add you up next time around. Or if you have topics that you want to suggest, please feel free to uh, drop us an email.